So we just developed a nice equation that says that when we perform impulse sampling, the spectrum of the sampled signal consists of an infinite collection of shifted versions of our original spectrum. So let's just take a look at some examples of what that means. So let's start with this signal right here, x of omega. So let's just, for the sake of uh, keeping things simple, assume that the signal that we sampled, x of t, in the frequency domain has a spectrum that looks like this triangle. So it exists from minus w to w, and it has a height of 1. And this is what the spectrum of the original signal that we're working with ha has in the frequency domain, and we're going to sample this. Well, we know what happens now when we do impulse sampling. When we do impulse sampling, this shape gets repeated up and down the frequency axis an infinite number of times. And it gets shifted up and down in multiples of our sampling frequency omega s. So this triangle gets placed at 0 and omega s and 2 omega s and 3 omega s, etc. Also at minus omega s, minus 2 omega s, minus 3 omega s, etc. We have an infinite collection of them, and there was also this scale factor, 1 over t sub s. So if I do impulse sampling for some value of omega s, my spectrum could end up looking like this. This is for a value of omega s that is relatively large compared to w. The space here between w and omega s is kind of a large gap. What if I did impulse sampling again, but with a smaller value of omega s? Well, the same thing's going to happen. My original shape is going to get repeated up and down the frequency axis an infinite number of times. But now here in this third picture, I have assumed that omega s in this picture is a little bit smaller than it was in this picture. So when I replicate it up and down the frequency axis, the gap isn't quite as big. When I go up omega s, I'm not going up quite as far. So this picture has a smaller sampling rate than this picture. That's why we can see more of tri triangles here, even though there's st the same number of them. So I go up omega s, up 2 omega s, up 3 omega s, etc. I still have my 1 over t sub s scale factor. Both of these are what we call sampling at greater than the Nyquist rate. We'll define very precisely what we mean by the Nyquist rate here in a minute. But at this point in time, we're sampling large enough such that the shifted versions are all plainly visible. I can still see these nice triangles up and down the frequency axis. Let's keep doing this. Let's consider now sampling just a little bit slower. So the first example we sampled a large number. We had really big gaps between the triangles. The next example we did on the previous chart, there was a smaller gap. Now I'm sampling at the point where there is no gap. My omega s now makes it so when I move this triangle up, the triangles are just perfectly touching in between here. This is what we call sampling at the Nyquist rate. I'm sampling at a rate so that I can still see my original spectrum. This is my original spectrum of my original signal. I can still see those triangles very clearly here, but they are at the point where they're starting to touch and starting to overlap just barely at this one point on the frequency axis. If I was to lower my sampling rate at all, so from here to here, from the second picture to the third picture, I have lowered my sampling rate even more. Now they're totally colliding. I can still picture having these triangles up and down the frequency axis. But now that they're colliding, what I see here is this solid line. So at this point, we are sampling what we call less than the Nyquist rate. And by viewing the spectrum of the impulse sampled signal, I can no longer see the original triangle that I started with. There's all this distortion going on because of this overlap. So all the cases we've looked at so far, this case right here and the two on the previous chart, those cases are okay. I can still see my original spectrum, and if I wanted to, I could even filter out my original spectrum and get back to where I started. This case right here, this final case where we have this collision, so to speak, is no good. I can't tell what my original spectrum is anymore. The triangle that used to be here is no longer there. It's a partial triangle with this elevated floor, and that's bad. If I was to try to filter and get back to my original signal, I can't do that anymore. This overlap when we sample too small is what we call aliasing. And this is bad because when aliasing occurs, this means that we can't look at this 
picture and tell what the original continuous time signal spectrum is, and that's a bad thing. We want to avoid aliasing. Aliasing is bad. When we sample too small, aliasing occurs, and this collision in the frequency domain occurs in our sampled signal spectrum, and we don't like this. And This is a bad thing, and this basically is what was happening in our intuition video a few videos ago in the cases one and two when we ended up with samples that didn't really represent the information in the original signal. What was going on was aliasing. We ended up with samples that were behaving like or were aliasing as another frequency. That's exactly what's happening here. Frequencies are aliasing to other frequencies and we're having these collisions. We can avoid this by making sure that we sample fast enough. In this example, fast enough was sampling at a rate two times W, where W was the largest um, frequency in the spectrum of our original signal. So this short sequence of videos has given you just a little insight into the mathematical equation we came up. When we perform sampling, we end up with an infinite collection of the original spectrum spaced out in the frequency domain. If we sample fast, if omega s is a really big number, we can always look at the spectrum of the sampled signal and see our original signal sitting there. In this case, that was a triangle. If we sample too small, if omega s is not greater than two times the largest frequency of our signal, then aliasing occurs. And here's an example of aliasing. When aliasing occurs, you have this collision, and you have frequencies that should be high frequencies too low. They are aliasing down as small frequencies, and this is a bad thing that we want to try to avoid. This video kind of investigated kind of a cartoon example where we had this triangular spectrum. In the next video, we'll actually go ahead and work out the math for what happens when you sample a sinusoid. So a little bit more concrete in terms of the math, and we'll look at how you sample the sinusoid and what its spectrum looks like for different values of sampling frequencies, and also look at what happens when you do it in MATLAB and look at sampling a sinusoid in MATLAB.